Now, last week, I made a statement about if you had questions, send them in, and we would be glad to answer your questions. And so, here's a question for today. And sometimes we'll do one question, sometimes more. But today, we're going to do probably one here. And it said this. And it, this is funny because it came in literally right after service last week. So whoever, well, the person who sent this in was watching the broadcast. And I mean, they must have wrote it while I was still preaching. I mean, because they sent it right in. It said, uh, no, I guess not because it says last week. Question for Mr. Blake. Last week, you said you would answer any question sent in to you. Okay, correction. I never said I would answer any question. Right? I said I would answer questions. Now, this is something, you know, we've talked about here before. <clears throat> Just because a person is in ministry does not mean <clears throat> that... Uh, could we have all kinds of people come. Come here, visit people I see on the road. And it's funny because a lot of people have heard our testimonies, they've heard our teaching, and they feel like they know us. And so sometimes you feel like you know me better than I feel like I know you because I haven't heard your story, right? And I maybe haven't listened to hours of you teaching, right? So it's kind of uneven in a lot of ways. But sometimes people, I'm just going to be honest with you. Can we just be transparent and just kind of share a little bit here? <clears throat> sometimes people take liberties uh, and say things and, and, and they think because you're in ministry, they can say anything they want and you're just supposed to just, it's supposed to be okay, right? It's never okay to be disrespectful, right? I don't care who you're talking to, right? That's one of the fast, especially all the staff here knows, if you're disrespectful, that's one of the fastest ways to get fired from here. If you're disrespectful to really any person. Now, understand, we deal with some people at times that are hard to deal with, right? Uh, Christian and non-Christian, okay? Uh, we learn how to deal with them, and you, you, have to, you have to be able to deal with people, but there is time for what the Bible, well, not what the Bible calls it, what, what we have come to call tough love, right? It's always good to love people. Sometimes love has to be a little tougher than other times, right? And so I want to make clear, uh, my staff knows, I mean, you know, we're Christian. We love people. We love God. We love people. We love you. We love people. Right? At the same time, my staff also knows that there's only so much they have to take from people. Right? And, and no, not you, because I know most of you and you're good people. Some. But there are some, okay, that really try our patience. All right? And so, you know, it's just not right to be disrespectful to people. And so that's part of being Christian is, yeah, you can ask questions, you can do things, and you can say things, but there's a way to say things and not be rude or disrespectful or think that you have a, a right to something. You, you understand what I mean by that? If you're in ministry, you know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, there's, we've had all kinds of issues uh, that I've seen on the road in different places with how people just treat people. And it's because we have this consumer mentality that people think, well, I, I, I come to this meeting and I put money in the offering, so I'm buying your time, so I own you for this period of time. Okay, God owns me, right? No person owns me. I'm not in any person's pocket. None of you pay my salary, all right? It's just that simple. And so I love you, and I will do everything I can to help you. At the same time, if you're disrespectful, you will be dealt with just like my staff would be if they were disrespectful to you. Amen? You, you understand what I mean by that? Let's just be Christian. How about that? How about we just treat people nice, love people, do what's right? All right? Real simple. Now, this has nothing to do with this question. Okay? Okay? It has nothing to do with this. <clears throat> but, it said, last week you said you would answer any question sent to you. Already corrected that. So here's my question. Now, this was last week. Now, I don't know if you know, today is August 16th. Right? Next week is the anniversary of Elvis Presley's death. That is today. Today is the anniversary of Elvis Presley's death. Okay. Do you believe he is in heaven? These are the questions I get. All right? <laughs> no disrespect. God bless you. We love you. Okay? But, <clears throat> okay. When he died, do you think it was his time to go? Ah, now, now you've asked a question I can answer. See, I can't answer the question. He says, do you think... 
Elvis is in heaven. Okay, that's, that's not my, I'm not going to say I, that's none of my concern, but that's none of my business. You understand? That's between Elvis and God. All right? He's not my servant. He never was my servant. He's God's servant, or, you know, it was or was not. That's a, between him and God. Okay? Uh, so I don't, here's one thing, though. My wife brought this up once. You know, Elvis was one of a set of twins because there was Elvis, Aaron Presley, and what was the other one? Uh, Garen, Elvis Garen Presley, I think it was. So anyway, anyway, they were twins. And one of the twins was stillborn. And so even if Elvis didn't make it, his brother did. So at least there's one good voice in heaven. Right? Okay, come on. Okay. <laughs> and they were twins. So, you know, he probably looked the same. Anyway, okay. Just saying. So. Now, <clears throat> what do I believe it was his time to go? Okay. He died at what? 43, 42, I think it was 42. Yeah. Um, no, it was not his time to go. Right? He should have lived at least twice that. Okay. There were several reasons for his untimely death. And some, I know there's some people out there watching go, he's not dead. I saw him at the burger shop. I know I saw him. No, okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> I saw 43 of him out in, out in Vegas the other day. So, no. Now, <clears throat> there was a lot of aspects that went into his untimely death, uh, a lot of different things. And, um, but one of those, one thing was his infatuation with his mother's death. Right? His mother died at 43. And he focused on that. And many times what you focus on, you bring to pass. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right? Um, there was a thing in my life that I had to break. Uh, when I was a kid, El uh, well, Elvis too, I liked Elvis. If you were my generation, there was no option. You liked Elvis. It was just that simple. <clears throat> if you didn't, you weren't American. You know, it's just that simple. So, um, <laughs> so, but when I was a kid, my, my hero at that time was Bruce Lee. And Bruce Lee passed away uh, at 32 years of age. And so for, and which is way too young. Um, but because of my infatuation with him and his life and his martial art, I studied his life to an unhealthy degree. And it started getting to me. That w because I, my, my life, I had it planned out. I was going to open up a chain of martial arts schools. I was going to be the next Bruce Lee. I mean, it was just that simple. That, that was my direction. That's where I was headed. And because he died at 32, that idea gets in your head. And so you start thinking, you've got to get everything done quick because you could die at 32. And that, was, well, that went on in my head, I'll, I'll be honest with you. And so that was a point that I had to break especially when I turned 32. I had to break that. But luckily, by that time, by the grace of God, um, I was walking with God, and he had actually cleared a lot of that stuff out of my head. But you have to be careful at what you focus on, because you might not say, okay, I'm going to die at that same age, but if you look at something too much, it becomes part of you. And so you have to take heed to what you look at, or else it will taint the overall spirit of you. When I say spirit, I don't mean your spirit or the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about your overall attitude toward things. Right? Now, again, back to Elvis. <clears throat> my, part of my answer is this, that Elvis, well, actually two, yeah. Elvis made a critical mistake, one of the critical mistakes he made, and it's one that most or many famous people make, is the fact that he surrounded himself with people who were yes men rather than friends who cared about him and would tell him the truth. And so it's always important. I remember in 2000, I think it was, year 2000, roughly there, uh, I was with um, Sid Roth. I went out to his radio program and his television program. We were talking, and we were just really kind of launching into some full-time ministry. And so I just asked him some questions, and he said, Is there, he said, if there's anything I can do to help you, he said, you know, what, what can I do? And I said, well, I said, do you have any advice? Any advice? Because I had advice from Dr. Sumrall. It was good stuff, and it's how I, you know, guided my life to a large degree. And I said, "But if you have any advice, I'd appreciate it." And he looked at me and he said, "Yeah." He said, "The most important thing," he said, "is this: always surround yourself with people that will tell you the truth." That's what he said. 
And that always stuck with me. And, and so <clears throat> that is one of the things that Elvis did not do. It's one thing that a lot of ministers don't do. And one of the things you can notice many times, and I understand there can be variations on this, but one of the problems that you see is whenever ministries get to a certain level, then they have a complete staff change. And the next level of staff that comes in is not the people they started with. And the next level tend to be yes people. People that are either enamored with you for some reason and they think you're great and they tell you that all the time. Right? And you, in, in many ministries, they push out the older people who will tell you the truth. Now listen, it's hard to tell people the truth when you're in their pocket. Right? In, in other words, if, they, if, if, if you pay them, it's hard for them to tell you the truth because you pay them, and if they think you might not like what they say, then they could get fired or lose money or whatever it is. And it's just, a, it, but it's in everything, not just ministry, it's in everything. <clears throat> now, on the, by the same token, now that's if staff is in, say, in the pocket of the minister, right? In other words, if they're getting paid by the minister, sometimes they're afraid to speak up. The other hand is there are ministers who are afraid to speak up because they're in the pocket of their biggest donor in the church. And so, you, you know, the number one thing is just don't be in anybody's pocket, right? You know, regardless, and I'm not going to get into the political thing, but you can look at people and just, well, I might as well just say it. You can pretty well rest assured and I'm, I'm not putting any political thing toward anything, all right? I'm not saying yay or nay. I'm just looking at something. You can pretty well be assured that Trump, running for president, can't be bought for money, right? Because he's got it. I mean, you know, he did. now, that doesn't mean he can't be bought, all right? There's still a whole bunch of other stuff other than money. There's other things that can buy people the money. Right, and there's part of that is just fame and fortune and that kind of stuff. So I'm not, I'm not, you know, putting anything there. I'm just saying that one of the good things is for a minister is to make sure that you're not in anybody's pocket because people will come around and try to buy in to the ministry, and they and by doing so they try to buy into your life, and then they try to buy your speech. You know, they try to buy your opinion, <clears throat> and that's one of one of the reasons. Pers me personally, I'm against a professional politician class. I think there should be term limits. I think, you know, maybe cer certain things. Um, <clears throat> just because, you know, if, if <clears throat> we need people that, are, that know how to get things done and not professional politicians. It's as simple as that. Uh, if, you know, if you keep getting professional politicians, you're going to keep getting the same thing because they're in their own class and they've got their own agenda regardless of party. Right? And personally, I don't care about party either way. Um, not saying I don't agree with one more than the other. I, I agree with the Bible, and the party lines up most of that. That's the party I would agree with. Right? <clears throat> so I don't look at anything just across the board. Anyway, so um, <clears throat> one thing on this as far as did, does, was it Elvis' time to go. Uh, I have a teaching that I did called, Does God Determine Your Time of Death? And if you don't, obviously this person has not heard this, but if you would like to get that and listen to it, I, I go through what the scripture says about it, how you can lengthen your days, shorten your days. Uh, does God know your day of death? Absolutely. Did God determine your day of death? No. All right? There's a whole difference there. Right? So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, uh, today being the anniversary of Elvis' death, uh, be nice to hope that he's with the Father, right? Uh, but again, like I said, that's none of my business. And the main thing is to make sure that you and I are ready to go when we go. Amen? That's the main thing. Uh, there was um, <clears throat> Dr. Sumrall actually asked the Lord one time, said, what? He said, how much time do I have left? And God spoke to him and said, "Your," he said, when you go, he actually gave him a scripture and it talked about his gray hair. And this was when he was a young man. He said, okay, I know I'm going to live to be an old man because I'm going to have gray hair. And so he said, I know that. And so he said, but God didn't tell him the exact day, but he knew he was going to live a long life. Well, he lived to 83, I believe it was. And so he lived a long life. The main thing is not about knowing what day you're going to die. The main thing is 
living like every day is the day you would die. See, if you live every day like you're going to die that day or the next day, then whenever it does happen, you'll be ready. Amen? So, main thing is, live ready, live right, ain't got anything to worry about. So, all right, we're going to release our children to go learn and be trained, so God bless you. In Jesus' name. All right. And can't think of anything that I might have forgotten, so I guess we're good. All right. So, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and go to John chapter 17. You know, it's, uh, it's amazing. We go around the world. We have destroyed uh, the sacred cows concerning healing, concerning the power of God, these things that people, that the, the traditions of man that the church has built up over the years. And it's funny because these things play out sometimes uh, as I'm getting ready to minister and I pray and I ask the Father, what, what do I need to bring out? And then he generally heads me in a certain direction and then, and, and I'm not going to give you the whole process, but it's really very simple. But I do, I do want to bring out some things. First off, several years ago, uh, many years ago, it's probably well over a decade now, I, have, I got a hold of four, no, two, two manuals that are spiral bound that were actually interviews uh, that this person did for several of the living generals of the faith. Okay? It included an interview with Lester Sumrall, one with John Osteen, one with Derek Prince, T.L. Osborne, Kenneth Copeland, uh, a bunch of the different people that were uh, especially spiritual leaders at that time. And it's funny because when I was reading these, these are just open interviews and they uh, transcribed them. And as I was reading them, it's funny because I got to Lester Sumrall and to uh, T.L. Osborne. And when they asked T.L. Osborne, it's, it's funny because they asked them all about the same questions. Who was most influential in their life and things like this. Which ministry or which minister influenced them the most? Who, what person influenced them the most? But one of the questions they asked everybody was this. What is your prayer life like? And it's funny because of all, all the other people answered pretty much, Lester Summerall was very telling. I, I liked what he said and because I'd already met him and knew him, I knew I could tell what he was saying. You know, I was able to read um, more out of it than what he said because I knew him. But T.L. Osborne, his answer was really kind of surprising because T.L. Osborne is, well, it was and is, I'm sure he's still the same way, uh, but he was a statesman. He was always very uh, nice and gentle with people, loved people, lifted people, just a, just a good person to be around. And so, but, so his answer really surprised me because when they asked him, his answer was real short and to the point and just real brusque almost. And they said, what is your prayer life like? His answer was, that's private, personal, and none of your business. And now for T.L. Osborne, that is so uncharacteristic of him because he was always just so easygoing and answers any question. But he was very direct and very short with them. He said, that's private, personal, and none of your business. But then he explained a little bit about it. And it's funny because... This morning, uh, we're not going to talk about prayer per se, but I am going to talk about something that most people, uh, one person in particular, but several other people have asked, actually asked me to teach on this over years now. And I just never did it. Now, I'll, I'll explain why, because it's a lot like Till Osborne. This is something, I'm going to talk about something today, for me, that is very, um, even my staff, I haven't, I haven't discussed this with our staff but I do think it's necessary mainly because God said teach this so I figured I would go with what he said and, and, and teach it even though I've never publicly uh, discussed this at all <clears throat> and what people want to say many, or what they want to know many times is okay would you teach on intimacy with the Holy Spirit what is your relationship with the Holy Spirit what do you do because remember years ago Benny Hinn put out his book Good Morning Holy Spirit and then there's been several other books. And then, I mean, the church has an entire, um, I want to say a doctrine, 
but it's like an unwritten law in the church of how we're supposed to act concerning the Holy Spirit. And I've never taught on it. Yeah, but there's a lot of things I haven't taught on. You know, there's areas that I need to teach on that I haven't. And, and honestly, if I don't teach on it, sometimes it's because I don't feel qualified. And there, if there's somebody that does it better, I would rather tell you, listen to this person on that. If, if I feel like they have a better revelation, better understanding, I don't, you know, I would rather you listen to them than me just give you my take on it. This particular topic of intimacy with the Holy Spirit it's not that I don't feel qualified, but I feel like T.L. Osborne. Honestly, it's private, it's personal, none of your business. Why? Because to me, talking about intimacy, intimacy with the Holy Spirit is like asking what my wife and my relationship is. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, oh, yeah, you know, we've been married 38 years this year. Uh, we love each other. Yeah, okay, that, that's not... The, the description of relationship I'm talking about. I'm talking about if someone asks me, tell me intimate details about you and your wife's intimacy. I'd say it's none of your business, right? And that's kind of the way I feel about teaching about the Holy Spirit, concerning intimacy with the Holy Spirit, because it is something that is sacred and, and private and personal, you know? Now, I personally uh, would never, well, not never, but because I can see it coming, but I would not feel, I wouldn't be the one here to do a marriage seminar. Why? Because, well, for one thing, for me, teaching on relationship, um, it, it's hard for me to do that. Because it's, it's, it's one thing to say, okay, uh, you know, like the Bible says, husbands, love your wives. Okay, I can, I can teach that. Why? It says it right there. It's getting into the, into the details. And we can say, well, do this and do that and this kind of stuff. But really teaching relationship, you, you, you can talk about relationship. I can give you hints about how to build relationship, right? Uh, but as far as coming to a seminar on marriage relationship, you can't build relationship through a seminar. You understand what I mean? Now, I'm not saying you can't learn it. I'm not saying you can't be taught it. I'm not saying that you can that you know, at a seminar, yeah, we could teach it and then we could, you know, let you couple off with your husband and wife and that kind of thing and go through some of the things and your relationship would grow and it'd be better. But as far as just, a lot of people want me to help them have a relationship with God. And you, all I can do is tell you about God. I can tell you some of my relationship and the, some of the things, but I cannot give you a relationship with God. You have to develop that. Just like I can't give you a relationship with your husband or wife, you have to develop that. You see what I mean by that? There's a lot of teaching you can do on it, and it'll help. I'm not against that. I'm just saying that for you, if you really want relationship, number one thing is just time and, honestly, time and effort. You know, a lot of people come to me and they want, they want a relationship with me. They want to come and be my best friend. And they want that best friend relationship overnight. It doesn't work that way. You know, relationship is based on trust. Trust is based on, over a period of time, proving you can be trusted. Really, that's what it comes down to. So most relationship is based over time. And the longer time you spend in relationship, the stronger the relationship gets. Yeah. Right? So um, in this area, it's really kind of strange talking about it. But... I do want to explain kind of twofold. We may have to take this into two sessions at some point. I may have to add to it. Um, but I wanted to talk about a couple of things. I'm just going to write, I'm going to give you some of these things. Um, and like I said earlier, the only reason I'm even talking about this today is because I believe it will benefit the body of Christ. If I did not believe that, I wouldn't even be talking about it. Why? Because it is a relationship between me and God and my relationship may be different than your relationship and should be because your relationship with your children, each relationship is different with each child. Even though you love them all and you love them all the same, but your relationship is different. 
And it's the same thing. So your relationship with your Heavenly Father and with the Spirit. And you realize we have relationships with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each one is a different relationship, and each one has to be developed. Right? And there's different ways of it. But now, so today I want to look at a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> it was funny because whenever I was looking at some of these little, just little notes I jotted down. 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, when I started studying healing and the power of God, we started destroying all these traditions and sacred cows. And for me, because you have to remember at that time, the, the stuff that I teach today wasn't taught then. And for me to teach this stuff and to go against the established you know, status quo and to stand up and say, this is truth. Now, I wouldn't stand up and say, now that person's wrong. But I would stand up and say, this is what the Word of God says. And many times when I said that, people heard me saying, that person that said this other thing is wrong, even though I didn't say that. Now, if I'd have been questioned on it directly, I'd have probably said, yeah, they're wrong. Because I had the Bible to go by. Well, for me to make that distinction, that was similar in my mind to Martin Luther, you know, deciding that the Catholic Church was wrong, you know, on 95 points. Right? That's about how many sacred cows I'd found too, about 95 of them or something around there. And so you had all these things, but it was a big deal to stand up and say, these are things I see that are wrong because it meant I was making a break from that type of thought. And many of the people that adhered to that type of thought totally pushed us aside. And it's funny, they pushed us aside then, and now they're teaching the same thing that we teach, but they still won't have anything to do with us. Right? Because now it, to do so, they have to admit they heard what we said and they decided to change and they don't want to do that. Now they act like you know, they were sitting in their living room and got a revelation from God. And many times it was because they turned on the CD. Just saying. So, <clears throat> now, <laughs> so, um, one of these things that, that has been, uh, like I said, been hard to talk about though, has been the relationship with the Holy Spirit and how that relationship, and it's funny because See, I've taught this before. Everything we teach, and it's funny because people say, well, you know, y'all don't rely on the anointing. Oh, yeah, we do. Oh, y'all don't believe in gifts. Oh, yes, we do. You know, uh, well, we never heard you teach on that. Well, just because I don't, haven't taught on it specifically doesn't mean we don't believe in it. But what we do is we, we teach you how to live it. And then if you look back, you'll say, oh, that's that gift. Oh, that's this gift. So the principles we're teaching and the, 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 the way we teach it and demonstrate it, we're teaching it, we're just not calling it the way most people call it. But we're teaching you to walk it out instead of just giving you doctrinal points of what to believe about it. You see? And so people say, well, you know, you don't believe in relying upon the Holy Spirit. But then how do people get healed? And if we're not, if we're not relying on the Holy Spirit, how are they getting healed? You know, we had people, I'll, I'll just be blunt, we had people that we had trained that went to Bethel and got kicked out of their healing room. They were getting more people healed than, than they were seeing healed. And then they went to them and said, how are you doing this? Oh, we went through Curry Blake's DHD. And oh, okay, that's enough. And they kicked them out. Said, y'all not relying on the, on the anointing enough. And they asked them, if that's true, how are people getting healed then if we're not relying on the anointing? And say, but it's because of the doctrinal standpoint that they didn't want to have anything. But the fact is, we can teach you this. Now, everything we do as Christians, and everything I do as a Christian, as a minister, as one who ministers healing, let me tell you, it is all done in relationship with the Holy Spirit. There's not one bit that I'm not relying on Him 100%. If I didn't think that, if I thought He was not present with me all the time, then any time I thought He was not there, I wouldn't dare reach out my hand to lay on a person. Why? Because that would be total presumption to think that I could force him to come just because I put my hand on somebody. Right? But the fact is, we believe and rely upon the anointing of the Spirit, meaning his total, constant presence. And so we rely on that all the time. So the fact is, it's not that we don't believe in the anointing, it's that we believe in it so much that we live it and we don't just talk about it. And we don't wait for him to show up because we believe the Bible that says he's always with us and he'll never leave us or forsake us. So we actually believe the Bible rather than just talk Bible, right? But see, people don't like that because they like the theatrics, they like the, the attention, 
you know, there's all kinds of reasons why they do different things. But the fact is, we teach you how to walk in the presence of the anointing, how to walk in the presence of the Holy Spirit on an everyday, minute-by-minute -minute basis, rather than waiting for Him to show up as if He is, you know, on a whim. And so, this is what we emphasize. Now, in saying that, and, and I want to, we're, we're going to have to look at this in two parts, and we're going to probably have to break it into two different sections. But what we're talking about has two different parts to it. The first part, okay, first off, let me say that there are certain things that the Bible says the Holy Spirit will be to you. Right? The Bible says He will be this to you. Now, then there's individual things that you need Him to be to you. Does that make sense? For instance, let me give you a couple of them. And, and what we're going to show you not just what they are, but we're also going to show you how to actually apply it. Because it doesn't do any good for me to give you information if it doesn't lead to transformation. Right? If there has to be an application to it, or you, we're wasting our time. Otherwise, we're just being, becoming you know, doctrinally and theologically intellectual, and yet that will not change a person's life. So I'm... And all, everything about JGLM, the DHT, everything we do is about application that causes change. So, first off, let me say this. The Holy Spirit will be to you whatever you need Him to be to you. Okay? And this is a big deal. Okay? So you might want to write that down. So He will be to you whatever you need Him to be to you along with the things that God has sent Him to be to you. See, there are certain things that God said, this is what He will do for you when He's with you. And those are, those are His offices, His roles, whatever you want to call it. But then there's times when you need specific things from Him. And that's for you, that He will, he will, he will be those things, He will provide those things for you at that time. But there are some basic things that the Scripture says He will be to you. Right? So we're going to talk about that. First off, just so we're all same page, okay? Repeat this after me and say it strong, right? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will, be to me will be to me whatever I need Him to be, I need him to be. Along, with along with the roles that God, roles that God has, sent him has sent Him here to be to me. Here to be to me. Right? Are we all in agreement with that? In other words, there's things that God sent him to do, and then there's things that you need him to do, and he will be both of those things. He will be the general things, and he will be the individual specific things. Because we want to talk about intimacy with the Holy Spirit, meaning functioning with him and having that close relationship. But to do that, first you have to find out who he is, what he is, how he operates, what God sent him to do. Right? Because you don't... For instance, if you think that the Holy Spirit was sent by God to teach you. How many of y'all agree with that? That's true, okay? Now, but you can think wrongly about that and, and be taught doctrinally that that sickness is what he's using to teach you. You see the difference there? So we want to make sure you understand he is our teacher, but we also have to see him as the teacher in the way that God sent him to teach and not take anything that happens as what God is using to teach. Amen? You, you with me on that? Okay. Now, so what I'm talking about, now, now get this, because if you, if you I, I should have brought my dry erase pens out here. What we're talking about here is you, you have your ideas, you have your, your thoughts, but then you also, a lot of your thoughts and your, your, your intelligence is tainted by an overall idea. You understand what I mean by that? It's, it's kind of like you have uh, logic, but your logic, as we talked about even in this morning session, your logic can be tainted by your, your overall philosophy of life. Because you can have, by, you can logically come to the conclusion that abortion and euthanasia is okay. You can logically come to that conclusion if you have a philosophy that will lead your logic along those lines. You understand that? And your logic would make sense even though it's flawed. 
right? Because of the philosophy. So you have to have, now and the reason I say that is because we have the Word of God, and to understand the Word of God, you really need the Spirit of God, which means you have to know Him. And if you know Him, then as He said, if, if, you, if you do His will, you'll know the right doctrine. You'll know whether it's right or not. Why? Because you're doing His will. Why? Because you're walking with Him. Now, give you some scriptures. What I'm talking about today, this goes to the very heart of the New Covenant message. Very heart of it. Because this, if you don't get this, now there's, there's a completely religious way we could look at this. We could look at it in the religious way that the majority of the church does even today. All over this nation, around the world today, there are churches that have gathered up and they have gathered down at the front. They have amazing praise and worship going on, meaning it's you know, concert-worthy music. And they will gather up and they will spend 45 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half doing what they think is worship and trying to call down the presence of God. And they will spend all that time just, just trying to do that. And they don't want to do anything until that presence is there. Now, that is an old covenant mindset. That's not a new covenant mindset. The new covenant mindset should be that you know when you walked in that door, the Spirit of God was here. Why? Because He probably came with you. Right? If He didn't come with anybody else, because you don't know who else is there is saved. Right? But if you know you are, you know He came with you. And that's a new covenant mindset. Right? When I was up in Chalice, Idaho, I made some people mad. I mean mad. You know? Uh, because they were doing all the stuff, same thing that the prophets of Baal were doing, except they hadn't gone to cutting themselves. Right? <laughs> I mean, they were dancing, yelling, you know, calling down the power, calling fire down from heaven. I thought, he really don't want that to happen, you know. <laughs> but, they're, I mean, they were calling this stuff down. And whenever it was my turn, uh, I got up to minister, and I just told them, I said, what would be the difference between somebody that doesn't know God at all, that broke down outside, their car broke, just happened to break down out front, and they came in here and they heard you trying to call God down, what are they going to think? They're going to think, wow, these people are just like me. They don't know God, but they're trying to find Him. And I said, that's not who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be those people that say, we know God, and if you're looking for Him, we can introduce you. Yeah. And I said, this, so this goes back to this. What I, what I really want to get to today, and if, like I said, we're going to have to break it into a couple of sessions. But I want you to realize that this is the heart of the New Covenant message. Because at some point, we cannot do... What everybody else does just because everybody else does it and because it draws crowds. We have to go along with what the Word of God says and function as new covenant priests and kings, right? Not old covenant priests. And so, in saying that, now notice, I've said before, well, yeah, because if we're going to function as new covenant priests, New Testament priests, okay, in the old covenant, the primary role of the priest was to represent the people before God. In other words, they went in, took in the offerings, and they represented the people before God. In the New Testament, the New Testament priesthood represents God before the people. They don't represent the people before God. You see? Because I can't go to God on your behalf and make your relationship right with God based on what offering I give. You understand that? So, why? Because this is a new covenant. And now it's, I hate to say it this way, it's every man for himself. All right? Pretty much is what it comes down to. And you're, you don't get in on your mother's or your grandmother's coattails. Right? You have to have your own relationship. You have to be born again. Matter of fact, in Hebrews it says, God said, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Judah after that, after this time. And he said, and it will be this. At that time, we won't be saying... Every man to his brother, know the Lord. Because all will know him. Meaning what? In that covenant, see, in, in the new covenant, we don't, in the old covenant, we had to go around and say, oh, you've got to walk right with God. You've got to walk with God. You need to walk with God. You need to learn God. You need to know God. That's the old covenant. New covenant, when you get born again, you're connected to him. Now, I don't have to tell you, know God, because if you're in the new covenant, you know God. 
Because you know Him when you became part of Him, whenever He was joined to you and you were made one with Him, you know Him. Now, you may not have spent a lot of time developing that relationship, but it's just like a lot of, a lot of children don't know their father, even though they live in the house with them. Right? All they know is the part of the father that the father shows. You know? And there's, there's a lot of fathers that are one way when the kids are there and a different way when they're not there. Right? And so the whole point is how much time do you spend? If you spend much time with a person, you're going to find out everything about them. Right? Pretty much. I mean, there's going to be very few things you don't know. But it comes through time and relationship of building that. Now, notice here. Our job as New Testament priests is to represent God to the people. Now, what that means is, see, I can't, I can't stand here and tell you, oh, listen, uh, you know, you, you're going to be okay. You're okay. I'm okay. Everything's all right. Everything's good. You know, and, and, and why? Because now I'm talking to you like a man would talk to you. But if I'm standing here and ministering the Word of God, and I stand here as a minister, as a new covenant priest, I'm not talking man to man or man to woman. I, ha I don't represent humanity to you. I represent God. I'm, you understand what I mean? I'm representing God. I'm here as God's representative to tell you what God would say if he were here. So I can't speak to you in human, just in, from human thought or even from human love. See, human love is where all of these errors come from. I have to speak to you what God would say. I speak to you from God's love and I have to tell you what God himself would say so I represent him to you so I can't talk to you like we would talk to one another. I have to talk to you the way God would talk to you. And you say, how do you do that? Easy, read the Bible. I read the Bible to you. right? And if I read the Bible to you because that's what God's going to say. Amen? So that's the whole point. Now, so I don't tell you no God because if you are born again, you know him. Now you say, but, but how do I get to know him better? Spend time. Spend time with him, right? Now, that doesn't mean necessarily taking time off and going and staying in a cabin and praying 24 hours a day. I'm not talking about that. Because, honestly, nobody can do that all the time. And if that's your idea of spending time with the Father, then you still have an old covenant mindset because you still think you've got to go somewhere to meet with him. The new covenant mindset is he walks with you every day, everywhere. So you can spend as much time you want with him, even if you're at work, even no matter where you are, uh, you know, shopping, at work, you know, wh wherever you are, you can be spending time with him, and that's communing with the Holy Spirit. Right? And that's how you build that intimacy and that closeness, is because you spend time with him, not just in here, not just when you're on a prayer mountain somewhere, but you spend time with him in your daily life. So the more time you spend with him in your daily life, then the closer that intimacy is. And it is just like being married, you know, for my wife and I, we're going on four decades of marriage. Four decades, right? Amen, amen, amen. And so, you know, we know each other pretty well, right? She can finish my sentences. I'm still trying to figure out her thought patterns, but anyway. Um, <laughs> she'll be in here in a minute, you watch. No, but... I mean, come on, what man can truly understand a woman and the way she thinks anyway? So, just had a line from a movie come to my head. Sorry, not going to say it. Anyway, it's, <laughs> yeah, it was, um, no, I'm not going to say it. Anyway, I really want to, though. <laughs> you can tell I really want to. <laughs> anyway, okay, there's a scene in this movie. Right? <laughs> Think Jack Nicholson was in it? He was a writer. And he said, How do you write like this, like a woman? He said, Well, I take away all logic and reasoning. And that's how he writes. Anyway, so. <laughs> <sorry. laughs> no. Well, it's because it's emotional. Women are emotional. You're sensitive. It's good sometimes. So, and <laughs> but see, we complement each other. So, but the idea is that the more time you spend with God, and you just walk with him. It's not about spending time in here. See, this is, and, and it's funny because years ago, well, like I said, my wife and I were going on four decades, and she can, you know, finish my sentences, and many times we'll, we'll say something, and we both know exactly what we're thinking because we have spent so much time together. And it's the same thing. We didn't get there overnight. You know, I mean, there was, you know, a long period of time where you're trying to figure out what each other's thinking and trying to, you know, figure out what, 
you know, how you can surprise this person or, or, or make them happy and these different things. There's things you're working on. But it takes time. And then it almost becomes an art, you know, to where you know, you know, oh, I'm going to have to tell her this. Well, so I need to do this first. So when I tell her that, it won't be near as bad. So you, say, you, you, read, you start to figure all these things out. And it's kind of the same thing walking with God to where you start to realize, okay, this is where, where he's going and where we need to go, and you start to work. But the, the whole point is, just like the Bible says about marriage, is that the two become one. That's God's will for you. Not just in, as a husband and wife, but for you to become one with him. So that there isn't this, okay, God, what do you want me to do? See, there's very seldom... <clears throat> The last time I said that was the year 2000. The last time I said, okay, God, i got to know what you want me to do. What do you want me to do? And that's the last time I've said that. Because now, see, you can walk in a level of intimacy with the Holy Spirit, which is not very intimate at all, to where it's just mechanical, and it's true, and it works. And you can say, just like in James, it says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask God who will give liberally and not upbraid, right? Is it God's will that you ask him for wisdom? No. No, it is absolutely not. Now, will God give you wisdom if you ask? Yes. Well, remember, James was written to brand new Christians. So they didn't know the, the wisdom of God. They didn't have the wisdom of God. But the Bible tells us that we have the mind of Christ. So if you have the mind of Christ... You don't need wisdom. You have wisdom. Yeah. Right? Then it tells us what 2 Corinthians... Actually, I think it's here. 2 Corinthians uh, 4. Let me find it here. Somewhere here. It is here. <laughs> yeah, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. No, that's not it. Sorry. <laughs> it's not the right. Yeah, uh, Colossians 2, 3. It says, In whom are hid, in Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 1 Corinthians 2. Oh, yes, yes. And, and in uh, 2.16, he says, but we have the mind of Christ. But all this wisdom and knowledge is in Christ. And Christ is in you. So you have all this wisdom and knowledge. So, it's, so you can walk at a level of Christianity where every day you say, Father, I need your wisdom. Give me wisdom. And he will give it to you. And he won't upbraid. And he'll keep giving you wisdom. And you can walk in that. Now, and many times that will come in the form of a gift of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, called a word of wisdom. The word of wisdom. Those are bursts of God's wisdom that he will give you at that time. But now you can walk in that by asking, God, I need your wisdom. I need wisdom. And you can walk in that and he will give you that wisdom. But Christ is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification. So he has made that to me. When I realize that, I realize I don't have to ask for wisdom. He has been made wisdom. I have his mind so it's there. So now all I have to do is decide to believe that and expect his wisdom to be present when I need it. Now, think how, because the Bible tells us that we are to be like Christ. Isn't that right? We're going to grow up to look like him. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. And it says that as he is, 1 John 4, 17, uh, it says as he is, so are we in this world. Is that right? Yeah. So Right now, present tense, we have this in us. And it tells us that we have, actually that was the one I was going to look at, is that we have, in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Now notice Colossians 2, 3 says, in him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, but we have this treasure, treasures of what? Wisdom and knowledge, Right? We have this treasure in earthen vessels. What earthen vessels? These earthen vessels. So this treasure, this wisdom and knowledge that is in Christ, and Christ is in you. So we have this treasure of wisdom and knowledge in these earthen vessels. This wisdom is present tense. Now if you're a brand new believer and you don't know that you have the wisdom of God, then yeah, you're going to ask and he'll give it to you. And that's fine. And you know, that's, it's living at a very spiritually immature level. But honestly, if you look around, that is the level most of the church operates at and, and they think that's the height of spirituality. They think the most spiritual thing I can do is ask God right now and Him speak to me and give me a word right now of wisdom and I'll know this and to, if I do that, then I have such a relationship with Him that I can ask and He will give me and I'll hear it and that obviously proves my relationship with Him is so good. 
And that's the way people think. And the reality is, is that God's a, a, a good relationship. Listen, I could, I could call my wife and say, uh, would you like flowers today? I could do that. But how many of you know, it doesn't take the wisdom of God to know the answer is already yes. Isn't that right? Why? Because I have learned that about her. And I know her nature and her character. And so the, the wisdom of what she would like is with me all the time. I don't have to call her and ask her. Why? We've been together 40 years almost. I already know this. We've walked together. We've walked through thick and thin. More, more thin than thick, I think, sometimes. You know? I mean, she stuck it out, right? I mean, you wouldn't believe. Okay? But the whole point is because we went through all these things together, we know one another. And because of that, I don't have to ask her for the wisdom of whether to bring her flowers. I know I can choose to do that anytime I want, and she will like it. All right? Now, other things I would know. Don't bring this. Don't bring that. Why? Because she wouldn't want this now. Right? Because I know her. And I know where she's at, you know, mentally at that point in time. And it's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. That as you walk with Him, we can walk at a level which is spiritually immature. Because That's why it says it in James. You can ask for wisdom and get it. But the better thing is to believe what the Word of God says, walk in the full, start to grow up into Christ, start to walk in the fullness of the Spirit, start to live out His mind that you have. And, and 1 John 2.20 says that you have an unction, an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. You get that? You know all things. You just don't know you know them. Right? Why? And the first step of beginning to know that you know them is to believe what the Scripture says, that you know them. Until you decide to believe that, you'll never have the reality of knowing them because you're thinking you don't know them and you've got to ask for it. But if you know all things, how many of you know? Okay, do you believe 1 John 2.20 that you know all things? Do you believe that? Okay, if you know all things, is wisdom included in that knowing? Yes. Then you have all wisdom. I mean, it's in there. Why? Because it's in the mind of Christ. The key is to start to walk in the mind of Christ on a regular basis rather than on a come and go basis. Does that make sense to you? Because this is how, okay, Solomon walked in this to a portion. Jesus walked in this all the time. You ever realize nothing caught him by surprise? He knew what was coming. Isn't that right? He knew all that. Why? Because he had wisdom. He had the wisdom of God dwelling in him. And so he knew Nathaniel. He saw him. You know, all, he, he knew all these people. Here's a person in whom there is no guile. How did he know that? He had the wisdom of God. And as Christ is, so are we in this world. We have that same wisdom. You can, God will tell you about people. He'll say, deal with this person. Don't deal with that one. Like them. Love them. Treat them good. Don't sign a contract with them. Amen? Amen? That's wisdom. And you go, well, why is that? I don't know. Why don't, why don't you, you know, I love that person. I do anything they ask me to do to help them or whatever I can do. But do I, you know, do I like them? Is there, a, is there a, an affection between us to where I want to hang around with them? No. Why? Because God reveals that. And many times you don't even know God revealing it. It just comes to you as kind of a, I don't know what it is. But if you took a few seconds and thought, what is that? You'd know. Yeah? Pray in tongues. It'll come out. But I'm talking about, what I'm talking about is walking like Jesus in the wisdom of God all the time and not every now and then. Amen. Right? I'm talking about walking in the foot because we can't walk like Jesus if we don't walk in His mind and have His mind living through us. His mind, we have His mind. You know, it says in um, 1 John 2, 27, you have no need that any man teach you. Why? Because the same Holy Spirit, the same anointing that abides in you teaches you all things. You say, then why are we sitting here listening to you? Right? Well, it's because God has placed in the body, in Ephesians chapter 4, ministries, the fivefold ministry it's usually called, and you can take, you know, 40 years to learn healing, or you can benefit from my, you know, almost four decades of study, and the Holy Spirit, if I do my job right, see, I have filled my mind with the Word of God, rightly divided, in context, concerning the power and the aspect of healing from God. Now, you can spend 40 years doing the same thing or 
if I do my job right, I can step out of the way, more or less, and let the Holy Spirit bring out to you from what He's put in there to you, and then you're being taught not by a man, but by the Spirit of God that is in me, and you're being taught by that Spirit, and you have no need that any man teach you, but the Spirit that is in you, will, that's in me at this point, it will be teaching you, and the Spirit in you, since they're the same Spirit, will bear witness and say that's true. Do you get that? Now, I'm, I, I, it's funny because I'm talking about a Christianity that is at, honestly, a whole different level from what most people ever even think about. Most of them think about it at a level which is simply, we're, gonna, we're, we're here on this earth, God is in heaven, we're going to beg for everything we need, and we're going to believe God, and He's going to give it, or something along those lines, rather than realizing God is not a faucet that you turn on and off. Right? That's, you realize when Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branch, He didn't say, I'm the faucet, and you're the water hose. Why? Because the faucet turns on and off. But when you talk about a vine and branch, the life that's in the branch comes from the vine. The life in the vine goes through the branch. There's no cutoff. Whenever there's a cutoff, the branch dies. See, that's why he was saying that. He said, listen, what's in me is flowing into you. The life that's in me is flowing into you. You have my life. That's what he was trying to tell you. I came to give you this life. What kind of life did he have? Life in abundance. So what did he say? That same life is flowing into you now. And he said, my mind is in you. My wisdom is in you. All of these things, it's all in you. That my spirit, the spirit that has been with you shall be in you. And he said, that's why I got to go. Because then when I go, I can send that spirit back and the spirit that was in me will be in you and he will bear witness with you. So I'm just trying to give you an, an overall idea of what it means to walk. See, now when we talk about this, this is... Just a level of walking with the Holy Spirit that you just don't hear. You know, I mean, I, I've listened to other stuff. And most of it is so spiritually immature that, and the bad part is, we think that's maturity. And if you think that's maturity, then when you get there, you'll stop. Rather than saying, no, that's just, that's elementary school. That's, that's kindergarten stuff. Let's move up and walk in Christ. And if we say we are in Him, then we are to walk even as He walked. How did He walk? Did He walk around all the time saying, Father, what next? Father, what do we do next? No, He was what? Constantly led by the Spirit. Do you realize, here's the problem. Most people think being led by the Spirit is that you feel the Spirit as you're walking. You feel somehow, you feel the Spirit saying, turn here, turn here, go there. And second by second, you're trying to be led you realize Jesus never tried to be led. He didn't have to try. Why? He was the Son of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. He knew, I'm a son, I'm being led. See, there's times that I, I can't give you the, the number of times that I'll be home or something and want to go somewhere for no reason. Want to go to a particular place. And invariably, whenever I have listened to that and done it, it was God. Right? And, but he didn't say, here's why I want you to do that. He just gives you the unction. Why? Because it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. His pleasure was for me to get up and go to this place. Why? Because there's somebody there. There was something. Uh, we went to, or I went to a, um, a water place yesterday to get some water. We have jugs of water here and at home. And... <clears throat> You know, why would I want to go there yesterday at that particular time? But it just so happened that there was a person there that while I was looking at the water and we were going to be talking to him about it, that the other person came in. And so whenever the lady started explaining to me about the water, this other lady was standing there and she said, can I listen in? So she started listening in. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> for some reason, this woman standing there started spilling her guts about her life. Just started, yeah, I just, you know, uh, just went through a divorce. It was an abusive relationship, and I had to leave, and I had to actually hide and, and do it this and get away from this and this. And, and then, so, then the, the lady was talking to me, and this woman just started just, you know, saying all this stuff. And then the woman looked at me and said, and, and what do you do? And I said, I'm a minister. <laughs> and the woman looks at me, and, and I, I said, yeah, I can help you. 
and, and, and so we got to talk like for five minutes because they were interested in selling water. I mean, that's the whole point. They were trying to sell water. Didn't really want to do a you know, ministry session there. They, they, that's not what they were looking for. But this person was like, do you have a card? I said, yeah, I have to go out to my truck. I got the card. Went out and said, yeah, you can give me a call. That's my cell number. Give me a call. Be glad to help. I said, there's issues that come with that stuff. We'll be glad to help you. We can help you. Just give us a call. And here's the office number. You can call. Make an appointment to come by. Whatever you need, just let us know. Right. Why right then? It made no sense for me to get up and go to the water place right then. Right? I could have waited an hour. There's, but it, it's now if did I, when I wanted to go to the water place, did I say, I feel the leading of the spirit to go to the water place? No, why? Because in my head that would have made no sense. But it is God who is at work in me. Philippians two thirteen, both to will and to do His good pleasure. His pleasure was for me to get up and go because there was somebody I needed to meet. Right? There was somebody that needed help. So did I? Think about it. Did I feel anything? No. But the part is, I don't have to feel. Why? Because I'm a son of God, and as a son, I'm led by the Spirit. And so wherever I'm going, I, that's, I'm going there to minister the gospel. For whatever it is, in any way that I do it. Now, so the whole point, when you talk about intimacy with the Holy Spirit, I'm not talking about this weird, wispy thing. Jesus wasn't weird, and he wasn't wispy. Right? He moved through life. Uh, okay, if he was weird and wispy, and I'm not condemning anybody or putting any group down or anything else, all right? You understand that? <clears throat> but if, if you could see that in the Bible, then people that are very conservative in their religious views wouldn't have a leg to stand on by them saying, oh, Jesus didn't do that stuff. You understand? I mean, if it said, and Jesus, overcome with the Spirit, began to, you know, shake and fall down. Okay? I'm not, I'm not against shaking and falling down. But it doesn't mention that. But if it did mention that, then those people in those groups would say, huh, there's something to this shaking stuff. But because it's not there, because Jesus didn't have to act a certain way, he walked in the Spirit. For some reason, we think when the Spirit is upon us, we have to act different. Right? He, he didn't come to make you act different. He came to let you live different. You understand? He didn't come to make you do things. And, I, and again, I'm not against that. And there's times when it's a blessing for people and all that kind of stuff. I'm just saying, that's not normal. Normal life is having the wisdom of God that wherever you go, you can speak a word to a person and you start talking to them and you're going this direction, all of a sudden it goes off this direction, you don't know, even know why you're saying it, but it's just coming out, and the person starts crying, and you're, you're blessing them. Right? That's the Spirit of God in you. You see? And, you, and the thing is, if you do that, it shows that you're smart enough to yield and just go along with Him. Why? But you don't stop and go, okay, well, I sense the Spirit wants to go a different direction. So, no, if you said that, they're probably going to walk off and leave you standing there. But in, I've had so many people come up to me and ask me for prayer. And as I start to minister to them, I say, you know, I'll pray or whatever it is, that, what they ask me to, and then I keep saying things, stuff starts coming out, and pretty soon it's, yeah, I needed that. I needed that exact thing. I needed this. Right? I didn't know it was a word of wisdom, but it was a word of wisdom, right? It was a gift in operation. But for me, it wasn't a gift. I didn't feel like, you know, all of a sudden, oh, he's here. You know, I feel something. So the next word that's coming out of my mouth is going to be, you know, thus saith the Lord, here it comes. It's not like that. Jesus didn't. You know, Jesus never said that. He never said, thus saith the Lord. You realize that? And yet everything he said was, thus saith the Lord. Right? Well, when everything you say is, thus saith the Lord, you don't have to say, thus saith the Lord. Right? That's how we're supposed to live. The Bible says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Everything you say ought to be, thus saith the Lord. So you shouldn't have to say, thus saith the Lord. You ought to just, why do we do that? Because we're, we're raised in religious circles that we think that's how you have to do it, or we are prideful and we want people to know, this is God speaking, and he's using me. See? And it, it all goes back to what are you really trying to do? Are you trying to be seen? Are you trying to be heard? Or are you trying to be helpful? Are you trying to minister to people? Are you trying to love people? How is it? All I'm trying to say is that this idea of intimacy with the Holy Spirit is not what most people think it is. It is walking. He says there's one that sticks closer than a brother. Right? He's, he's closer than your best friend. So how do you act when you get around your best friend? You know, every time you do see him, do you get, you know, giggly and, you know, 
I just don't know if I can stand being around you. I'm going to fall down. I mean, come on. Is that how you act? No. Why? You're not going to get much done if you do that, right? There, is there times for that? Absolutely. Have I had experiences with the Holy Spirit in, in the private time of worship? In there? Absolutely. And you say, well, what happened? It's none of your business. It's private and personal. It's between me and him, right? And it was a blessing for me. I hope it blessed him because it sure blessed me, right? But I don't do that every day. Why? Because I'm not here to be blessed. I'm here to be a blessing. So I learned literally how to walk with him in a way that I give, um, I yield to him, but as we go. Now, if he wants to go over there and I want to go over there, I can decide to go over there. He's not going to make me go over there, right? And the amazing thing is, if I, by force of will, decide I'm going here, then whoever's over there, they will get blessed because he will still love them and bless them over there, even though he wanted me to go this way. Why? Because he's that kind of God. He's that kind of Holy Spirit. He loves people and he'll minister to them, even if those... Listen, you can decide today, I'm going to be a missionary to, you know, the Philippines. And God says, really don't want you in the Philippines. I really want you over here on this Native American reservation. How, how about you go there? No, I'm going to go to the Philippines. You know, I'm going to the Philippines. Well, guess what? You can go to the Philippines. You can bless people. People get healed. People get delivered, saved. God, it'll be, you, could, you could cause a revival. And yet when you stand before God, God says, yeah, I blessed them all. And that was good. That's not really where I wanted you. I wanted you in that Indian reserve, even though... Wasn't going to be a big revival breakout. But you went there, that's fine. You see what I'm saying? You can decide to do these things and God will still, why? Because God will be to you what you need Him to be. Amen? Now there are certain things that He wants. Not that He wants necessarily. He does want it. But there are things that God has said He will be to you. So let me, let me is this helping you at all? I mean, because I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm trying to show you some of the things that goes beyond just the, our traditional view of this stuff. Right? So, here he says, I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures. Uh, yep. We're going to go to John 17. Isn't that where I told you to go first? Okay. 45 minutes ago? Okay. John 17, verse 15. <clears throat> I pray not that you should take them out of the world, this is Jesus praying, but that you should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now notice this. As you have sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Now, now think about this. Now, th listen, this is not a trick question, but you don't just answer, okay? Did Jesus represent the people or did he represent God? Now think about it. He represented God in his life. He represented people in his death. Is that right? But when he walked, he walked this earth to show us how men walked with God living in them. Right? So he represented God to us, to people. But on the cross and at the whipping post, he represented the people before God. Right? Because he, he went through all of that for us. So, Remember, Philip said, show us the Father. And he said, I've been with you all the whole time. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So what was he showing us? The Father. What was he representing? The Father. Are you with me so far? Right? <clears throat> now, in verse 19, he said, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That would be all of us that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me. And notice, being in, in him was being one with him. And I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Hear that? We're talking about this union, this, this, this life of the, of the vine flowing through the branch. You've got to realize, and this is honestly, it's not just my heart's cry. This is, Honestly, this is the cry of the Father's heart. He doesn't want us separating ourselves from Him. What do we do? Oh, God. Oh, Holy Spirit. Father, send your Spirit. God, come down. Okay, if I'm talking to Him that way, what does that mean? We're not one. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus never said, Father, send your Spirit. No, Jesus walked in obedience and the Spirit met him. 
Amen? And it, it, it landed upon him, and it never says it left him. Isn't that right? So quit separating yourself from God. Quit think of, thinking of him. Where, he said, where I am, that they may be also. Wherever he is, you are. Wherever you are, he is. You're seated with him, and he's here walking with you. So whether you're here or there, you're one. You're together. Don't separate the two. Don't let any man separate what God has joined together. We use that in marriage all the time. Why don't we use it in real Christianity, which Paul used marriage to represent real Christianity. Union between God and man to where we walk as one. To where, you know, you, you think. You, it's funny because if you really walk with God, you understand I'm not saying you're God, okay? If you believe you're God, ask your wife. She'll tell you you're not, right? <clears throat> so, but if you really understand this oneness, whenever you commune with God, it will sound like you're talking to yourself. Amen? You understand that? You're not talking to yourself because you're not God. But as He speaks, you already know what He's going to speak because all that wisdom and, and knowledge is already in you and His Spirit is bearing witness with your spirit that what He's saying is the truth. And so it's almost like you already know what He's going to say before He says it, but when He says it, you, already, you automatically know to agree and it sounds like you're talking to yourself. Is it any wonder that in the Middle Ages or the medieval times, whenever a person started walking with God, they thought they were crazy and would lock them up? Well, guess what? They still do that sometimes. Right? I mean, honestly, you either get so full of the devil or so full of God. And if you get so full of the devil, you get locked up. Right? And many times you get so full of God, you get locked up. That's what happens. You say, well, how does that happen? Because you don't fit in. Right? And if they can't lock you up, they'll try to crucify you with your, you know, crucify your character or something. They'll try to do something. Why? Because it's, a, it's an offense against religion whenever you walk in the fullness of God. Because religion likes to control people and manipulate, and God likes to free people. Yeah. Amen? So, very quickly here, I'm going over here a little bit at a time. <clears throat> he says here, um, yeah, that they may be warning us, verse 21, that the world may believe that you have sent me. And the, Now watch this. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them. That they may be one, even as we are one. You hear that? Now, he's in us, we're in him. He's in the Father, the Father's in us, the Spirit's in him, the Spirit's, the Spirit's in us. We're walking in the Spirit now. And we're in, you get this thing that you can't tell you know, it's like I used to tell people, it's like the shell game. You can't tell who's who. Why? Because you shouldn't be able to tell where you stop and he picks up. Because if you can tell where, see, if you have, if you can tell where you stop and he picks up, you're double-minded because you have the mind of Christ. And it's supposed to go in everything. You got that? It's just like, you look at, you look at a marriage. If you got, if people are not of one mind, they have two minds, you have division in that marriage. And then that's where, Chaos comes from. That's where the division, I mean, you know, the arguments, fights, all that kind of stuff. Why? Because you're not one. You have two different minds, two, di two different opinions of where you should go. Right? I'm not saying you can't have different ideas of how to get there. But where you're going, you ought to be of one mind of where you're going. Amen? And it's the same thing with the Father. That's why I'm talking about this, this is why I'm... See, this doesn't fit in with the normal idea of what intimacy with the Holy Spirit l looks like. Why? Because most people think that intimacy means you're over here lost in this cloud-like thing and nobody can talk to you because you're lost over here. You know? That's, Jesus did not live that way. Jesus was among people. He did pull himself aside at times, and, and you should too. But those were at times, and they weren't all the time. He spent time amongst people, and he was always showing the Father. We ought to be able to spend time among people and still show the Father. Why? And it shouldn't be a hard thing. You know, it's like, okay, well, okay, I've got to get away from everybody because I'm, I'm tired of being this. No, this is who you are. Right? That's why I tell people, the longer I talk, why do you think it's so hard for me to shut up sometimes? <laughs> the longer I talk to you, the stronger I get. And who wants to stop getting stronger? I mean, that's why I tell everybody, every one of you, and we ought to take, you know, some, it'd probably take a whole weekend, but let's, you know, at some time we ought to just Get everybody and say, one by one, preach five minutes. You know, take a verse 
about the, this new creation and just talk about it. Read it and talk about it and watch what happens because if you want to know this stuff and you want it to live out in your life, teach it. When you teach it and you share it, it grows in you. See, you think, well, I don't want to share because I'm afraid and I don't think that. No, it ain't got nothing to do with that. You share because you'll grow. Right? You, you share with people, you grow. They grow, but you grow. Why? It's sowing and reaping. You can't give to them and you not get back. That, if that were true, that, that would make no sense for God to say, here, I want you, and this is what the church says. Oh, I've poured out and I've poured out and now you've got to carry me off stage. Right? <laughs> Why? Because I've poured out so much and I'm weak and you've got to carry me off because I've just, I've just poured out. Then you're doing it in the flesh. Amen. See? The, the longer I go, the longer I can go. Amen? Amen? Why? Because he just keeps getting stronger. And when I finish praying for people in the middle of the night, I'm not tired. Man, I'm wired. Amen. You know? I'm ready to go to Denny's and eat, you know? And, you know, because I've been, I've been going and, and I still want to talk about this stuff, you know? I want to hang out and keep talking about it. See, it's not a matter of, well, I'm just giving out, I'm just giving out, and I just have no more to give out. Then you're doing all that out of the flesh. You're doing it out of your soul. You're, you're, you're doing it for some, you know, out of something other than giving it out of the Spirit because you cannot deplete the Spirit that's in you. Not if you have the same one He had in Him. Right? And if you have that Spirit, let me tell you, that, that, that Spirit, that's rivers of living water flowing out of you. It never says, and then whenever the rivers have ceased flowing, that's when you quit giving. No, he didn't say that. Man, you, you know, it just gets stronger and stronger. Amen? And that's the way it should be for all of us. Every one of us in here have rivers flowing out of us. You know? And you look at all these rivers, especially in the Midwest, you know, they all kind of, where do they gravitate toward? The Mississippi. You have all these tributaries. They're all doing what? Tributing, contributing into this massive river. That's the way the body of Christ is supposed to be. We're all a tributary. We all have these rivers flowing out of us and we get together, we got all these tributaries coming together in order to be this massive Mississippi type river just flowing and it should wipe out any obstruction, anything that's in the way and the kingdom ought to just be seen through all of us. That's the way this life is supposed to be. See, in, even individually, listen, we're not limited. We are unlimited by the Spirit of God in us. The only deal is, we, as I've said before, too many times we end up being dams. And we need to realize how to open those dams and just be rivers of living water. Amen? But now, you can't, if, that, if I have this rivers of living water flowing out, where am I in this? Well, we're in here all mixed together. You can't tell the difference. That's all I'm trying to get across to you. You want intimacy with the Holy Spirit? Realize that, you, that He is so intimately connected to you that you can't tell the difference between him and you in the spirit. Amen. And that that life is just flowing out of you and it's just, it's just going. This is the life he wants you to live. This is that life in abundance. This is those rivers of living. That's where all this works from. It's not about you getting off and, you know, and going and singing the song of Solomon to Jesus. You know, nothing wrong with that. I mean, those things are all true. But that's not the height of it. Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for a friend. You want to show Jesus you love him? You don't just so, so, you know, supposedly sit at his feet and sing the Song of Solomon. You get out and you show people Jesus by loving them. And by doing that, you're showing him you love him. See, you don't cut yourself off. And, well, I just want to, I just want to be here. Because, yeah, there, you can, man, you can go there. Just getting alone with God and spending time, yeah, it's addictive. You will want to do only that. But that's not the height of Christianity. The height of Christianity is being able to know that you are one with Him and take it out to the world and be around the world. Listen, that's where the devil tried to get in the church and tried to make the whole church monastic. Go off into a monastery, hide, pray, and get so spiritual that you do absolutely no good for the world. And that's what he tried to get us into. But instead, we have to learn, no, I'm the monastery. This is his temple. I don't have to go hide. He's in here. And anywhere this temple goes, he goes. This is what John Lake was preaching. This is what turned the world on its ear whenever they started hearing these things. They started saying, can this be true? It's more than can be true. This is truth. Amen? Let's all stand up. I've gone over what I intended to. There's a lot more. We will. This will be in several...
sessions, I'm sure. Because I, I want to go into you, I, I want to show to you. We know that He is to lead us, guide us into all truth. Isn't that right? He, it said, and when, he, when the Spirit of truth has come, He shall guide you into all truth. You got that? He shall. When He comes, He shall. Now, that has nothing to do with you. He shall. Right? It doesn't say, as we say in Texas, y'all shall. Okay? <laughs> it says He shall. See, there are things that you need to decide. This is what He is to me. Right? His, his role in my life, He is a guide. He guides me into all truth. Why? I have all truth. He just brings it out and reveals it. And He brings, He shall bring to your remembrance everything He said. It is His job to bring to your remembrance. It's not your job to try to dig up what Jesus said. It's His job to bring it to your remembrance. Now, this is the jumping point, all right? This is the, 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 the great chasm between normal Christianity and Bible Christianity. Normal Christianity you know, is, well, He's over there and I'm over here and He can send me information. But Bible Christianity is very simple. That information is there. It's like fiber optics. It's going both ways at the same time, all the time. It's always on. It's always flowing. Right? And so at any time, really the reason most people don't walk in it is because they don't take time to, number one, decide to believe that God can do that. And number two, actually take time to start walking in it instead of, you know, they want to live their busy life and then run to church, hit their knees and go, oh God, help me. Bam, okay, you're on your way and go back and live your busy life till next week. That's not God's will. God wants you to take time to walk with Him and that doesn't mean being weird. But it means walking with him in every situation. If you've got a problem, uh, I'm, I'm trying to shut down. I really am. I really am. I have, well, okay. John Lake had a diary. It's been published several times now. They didn't publish, well, they published most of what he wrote. But in the back of his diary, I've, I've held his diary. I've looked at it. I've read it. I've went through it. In the back of his diary, it's in South Africa it's right, right now. In the back of his diary, his sons did their math homework. The, the, it's still there in the back of the diary. You can turn to the back and look at it in there. And they just took some, pen, uh, some pencil and just scribbled some stuff in it and it was their math homework. And John Lake told a person that was teaching their kids up in Spokane at one time. He said, they said, I'm having a hard, his son came home and said, I'm having a hard time with math. He said, well, why? He said, I, I'm just having a hard time understanding it. And he said, you know, I don't know if it's me or if it's the teacher, I don't, know what, you know, I don't know what it is. And so John Lake went to the school and said, how are you teaching math? And it, and it was a Christian, I mean, the woman was saved and spirit-filled, the teacher was. And she said, what do you mean? I'm teaching math like I always teach math. He goes, oh, well, but you're a Christian, you have the Spirit of God. And she said, well, yeah, but what does that got to do with this? He said, let the Spirit teach math. And she said, what are you talking about? He said, well, you have the Spirit, yeah then just decide to let the Spirit teach math through you. And she said, okay, how do I do that? He said, just decide to let Him. And she said, okay. And so they kind of went through a prayer. Okay, I decide to let the Holy Spirit teach me and teach through me. So then, about a week later, his son came back and goes, I got it, I got it. Why? Because the teacher allowed the Spirit to teach math. Now, math is not a spiritual subject, necessarily. Right? Necessarily. It's perfect science, but never, never, nevertheless. But there, what was she doing? She was, because of our, her mindset, she was only teaching, the, she was teaching what she thought was a secular subject without the Spirit of God. We're not supposed to do anything without the Spirit of God. God can teach you how to build things, how to do things, how to create things, how to invent things. Why? Because he's got things we haven't even seen yet. Right? And he just wants to pour that through you. And, you know, a lot of other areas. A lot of things he wants to do. But our problem is, we think, this is my religious life. This is my business life. And I'm going to keep God over here because he's not interested in my business. He is. Go read. A whole lot of the Old Testament is how to do business correctly. A whole lot of Proverbs is about just weight and measures and doing things right. He's interested in every aspect of your life. But you have to expand those borders to include those areas in your spiritual life. And you start to realize, you know, whatever area it is, maybe you're a real estate agent 
and you know, he says, you know, buy this property, sell this property, do this thing. Why? Because there's something here you want, or I'm, I want you to buy this because I got people coming, they need this land, and you can get it this price. I mean, he can he can do those things through you. Just don't limit him in how he can work through you and start to realize you and he are one. And the things, some of the things you want to do that make no sense, it's because you're not thinking with the mind of Christ. And you have to start deciding to think with the mind of Christ. And when you do, you're going to think kingdom, and then you're going to think beyond yourself, and you're going to think things, why should I do this? It won't benefit me necessarily, but it'll benefit others, and you can't help others without it benefiting you. So this is what it means to walk in the Spirit. This is what we're talking about. See, walk in the Spirit, this is an intimacy with the Holy Spirit. To whenever, if, if you walk with, it's just like dancing. You know, if you're going to dance with somebody, you know, together, I'm talking about slow dancing or, you know, dancing. Only one of you can lead. Right? But the other has to be a good follower. Right? And if both of you try to lead, you ain't going to work. But if one can lead and the other in, in a good, you know, okay, um, <laughs> Fred and Ginger. Okay? See how many of you, my generation, Fred and Ginger. Okay? <clears throat> You know what made them such a great dance couple? Because they weren't a couple. They moved as one. That's what made them so good to watch. Why? Because there was no jaggedness about it. They moved as one. That's the goal of the Holy Spirit. So that you and He move as one. It's not you move or He moves and then you go, oh, let me catch up. No. It's that you can sense the shift. You can sense what he's going to do next. And you move with him. Right? Just like riding a motorcycle. Somebody on the back of your motorcycle, they've got to learn how to lean their weight with you to know what you're going to do. You're one. Does this make sense to you? I'm trying to use every natural illustration I can think of. Okay? But does it make sense? Now, but the first step to that is to decide it's God's will for you to walk in that. That's the first. And once you make that decision, you make that, you say, well, how do I go from there? Just make that decision. This week, just make the decision. Flip that switch and watch. Because that's when he floods in. When you make the decision, that's called faith. And he floods in and then it starts working. And by the time we get back here next week, you'll have testimonies. You're going to say, you know what? Some of the things I just feel like I need to do, I'm just going to go with it and see what happens. And you watch. You will have God encounters. You'll have all kinds of of testimonies, everything's going on, it'll be amazing. And you're going to go, wow, this is a, so much easier than trying to figure out where God wants me to go next before I get up and go. Now you just learn to flow with Him. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank You. Your Word is true. Father, I thank You that I've preached what You gave me to preach today. I believe that it bears fruit. I believe that it goes into their minds and that their minds are renewed and that, Father, that You will be able to live your life through them in a greater way than you could before. So, Father, we give you praise and glory. We lift up the name of Jesus that has made this union between all of us and yourselves possible. So, Father, we thank you. We bless you. And in Jesus' name, Father, we, we desire that intimacy with you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we thank you that we know you desire it even more than we do so we know it's a done deal in Jesus' name. So be it. So be it. And right now, in Jesus' name, if you're watching by internet or even if you're here, you can be healed right now. I'm going to, it's going to say pray, but that wouldn't be accurate. So we're going to do what the Bible says. We're going to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils in Jesus' name right now. If there is sickness, ailments, pain, demonic influence, in Jesus' name, right now, I set you free. In the name of Jesus, by that name, I set you free. Right now, be healed, be whole, be free. In the name of Jesus. Beloved, above everything, He desires that you prosper and be in health. Even as your soul prospers, right now, be in health. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, amen.
Well, you are dismissed. If you need prayer or ministry, I'll be glad to minister to you. Other than that, God bless y'all.